So I love the story of Doubting Thomas. I've loved it since I was a kid. I mean, here is a disciple who, on a fundamental level, I understand. See, Peter was called the rock, and he was strong and brave, and I never really experienced a lot of those things. And I was a bit of a troublemaker, so I wouldn't be anyone's beloved disciple. But Thomas, Thomas I understood. His actions and words were similar to how I figured I would act in certain situations. But I always thought that Thomas's denotation as doubting was a bit of a, no, a misnomer, because he wasn't intentionally doubting his friends. He was just a natural skeptic. We all know people like this. I am this person in my family and in my friend group, but you guys are definitely thinking of people in your lives, or maybe it's you. It could be siblings you grew up with, or children, or cousins, or whoever you were around growing up. These are the kids who figure out certain truths about holiday characters well before they are supposed to. So then you spend a couple years bribing them not to tell other kids. Um, for me, it was second grade. I was, uh, how old are you in second grade? Eight years old. I was in Mrs. Strom's class. And I came to school one morning and announced to the entire class that at recess that day, I would be revealing a deep truth about a certain teeth-obsessed character um, that I had learned recently and that it was important for me to share. The, the teacher didn't take really kindly to this, seeing as how I was going to shatter certain kids' dreams. So she kept me inside for recess and sent a letter home to my parents saying, maybe fix your child, because this isn't right. For people like Thomas, and even me, belief is hard. And when a truth is shattered, we feel the need to share that new truth. But before we jump into the story of Thomas that we see here, I think we need to look at who Thomas was, what we actually know about Thomas and when we first meet him. So both his Greek and Hebrew name, Thomas and Didymus, both mean twin, but we don't really know whose twin he was. We just know that he was a twin. The first time we hear from Thomas is in John 11, when we're told about the death and resurrection of Jesus' best friend, Lazarus. Lazarus had recently fallen sick, and Jesus knew he was going to die, so, he's like, so he decided he and his disciples should go to Judea to be with him because he knew God was going to do something amazing. The disciples weren't really about that because last time they were there, Jesus nearly got stoned to death. So why on earth would they go back? So while the disciples are cowering in fear, trying to figure out how to encourage Jesus to maybe not go check on his friend, Thomas says something important. The disciples are debating, and Thomas speaks up and says, Let us go too, for if Jesus is going to die, we should too. This introduction to Thomas is important in the whole picture of Thomas, because often we think of Thomas as a jerk who didn't believe his best friends when they told them their master had returned. Thomas isn't any of that. Thomas is deeply loyal, deeply brave. If, his, if my master is going to die, so too shall I. Thomas was a worst-case scenario kind of guy. He fully expected Jesus to die. He saw the cross coming well before others, but he just assumed he would be there to die with Jesus. Now, when I was in my sophomore year of college, midway through, I finally figured out what, what my life was going to look like forever. I had my life planned. It was together. I had it planned out for the next 150 years. That's about how long I plan. I'm going to be about 170 when I go. It's cool. We'll talk about it later. But... I had figured out exactly what life was going to look like. Um, I, was plan I figured I would go to seminary one day. I knew I was called to that. But for a while, I was going to go join the Peace Corps and run around a foreign country and help people. That felt like a pretty cool thing to do. A semester before, fun funny story, a semester before, I had actually got the notion that I was going to drop out of college and become a traveling angel, stopping in cities all across America and helping an individual or a family and then disappearing into the wind. Uh, when I called my mom to tell her that that was my new life goal, she reminded me that I just, in perfect detail, recalled the plot to a 1980s TV show called Highway to Heaven, starring Michael Landon, and that I really needed to turn the TV off when I went to bed. 
<laughs> After the traveling angel bit fell through, I figured I needed to get a plan A together, and the Peace Corps came along. Plan B was to maybe become a teacher, but I didn't really need that plan because plan A was going to work no matter what. This was my plan for a solid three years, uh, until two months before graduation, when, by freak accident, my final interview appointment with the Peace Corps recruiter was deleted from their calendar, and I sat in front of my computer for an hour and a half waiting for them to Skype me when no one was ever going to call. By the time we scheduled a makeup interview, all the spots to my preferred mission were taken, and I was without a dream. My plan A had been shattered. I withdrew from all of the fun of the end of college. I stopped hanging out with people. I sat in my room. I sat in my apartment. I watched a bunch of TV, and I didn't really talk to anyone. I knew that there were others who were just as unsure and scared and confused as I was, but being around others made me feel like everyone would realize I'd been faking it for four years. I had somehow tricked everyone into thinking I was an adult who had my life together, when in fact... I was wildly lost. I had made everyone think I was a smart and capable human when I felt like I knew nothing. It is in this pit of sadness and despair that we actually find Thomas after the crucifixion. He had withdrawn from his friends and gone into complete isolation. This thing that he had honestly planned for, because he saw Jesus' death coming, but he had planned to go with him. He, this thing had occurred and he was heartbroken. Jesus was heartbroken that Jesus had died and he didn't die with him. He was likely so overcome with grief that to be around others would make it impossible for him to heal. New Testament scholar William Barclay poses it, poses it this way. Thomas was likely so brokenhearted that he could not meet the eyes of another man, for they would be so full of tears at all times. So while Thomas is off, figuring out how to heal, how to cope, how to get through the next day without his master. His friends are hiding, afraid for their lives. The women had already gone out and preached the gospel, the good news that Jesus has been resurrected. But the ten gathered together did not believe until Jesus himself showed up. Jesus shows and, Jesus shows and reminds his disciples that they have a job that Jesus was sent from his father, and that they were being sent from Jesus. And it is with that charge that the others ran to tell Thomas the news. See, what's true about skeptics is that you cannot tell a skeptic that their best case scenario has occurred. They're not going to believe you. The best case scenario is not likely to happen in a skeptic's mind. All that Thomas had ever wanted was for this man he loved and followed to be alive. But Thomas was a realist. He knew that that was just not how the way, that was just not the way the world worked. That people didn't die and come back to life. Sure, Lazarus did, but that was a one-time thing. Thomas was sure that the other ten had sat around in a dark room, telling each other that the reality they were living couldn't be possible so far to the extent that they deluded themselves into creating a story. A story about a risen Savior. A story of a Savior who could walk through doors and appear among them. So Thomas offered what he thought was the best case scenario. He offered a test. See, Thomas wasn't challenging Jesus because Jesus was dead. Thomas wasn't challenging God. God wasn't in this instance. Thomas was challenging his friends to come out of their fantasy and accept that they were living in their own worst nightmare. So when I was in my funk, when I was in my cave, when I was in my darkness, my friends couldn't help, help me. My friends are incredible, some of the best humans in the world. I talk to them nearly nightly. But in, that mo in those days, in those moments, in those weeks, they couldn't say a word to me without me rejecting whatever it was. All they could do was sit there on our beat-up old couch and eat jelly beans with me and watch dumb TV. I was worried about being around people outside of my apartment because I had no plan for the future and everything was in chaos. 
I received all the good Christian platitudes from my other religion major friends or my mom's friends back home and all the good Christians in my life routinely told me, don't worry, God has a plan for you. It'll get better. There's a reason for everything. Those things didn't help. I had friends offer to let me stay with them and work for their dad's business while I figured, out, uh, while I figured to get my life together, but that didn't seem real to me. What, ha- what had to happen for me is exactly what had to happen for Thomas. Jesus showed up in a real way. Jesus showed up in my doubt and in my disbelief and pointed me to something I couldn't believe I could be called to. A professor slash mentor sat down with me and asked what it was that I enjoyed doing. After spending four years in college, no one really asked you what do you enjoy doing, just what is your major. So when she asked me this, I was taken aback. Now, I loved my summers. I loved spending every summer working at Lake Junaluska, working with middle and high school students who were insane and crazy and fully unable to function as real humans, yet they were trying to. She encouraged me to look at those things, to look at how I lit up when I talked about working with youth, and to consider working in that. Now, I had had youth pastors growing up. I did not want to be a youth pastor. Youth pastors are often overworked. They're tired. They do things way outside their job description, such as preaching on Sundays when their pastors are in Italy. I didn't want that. I knew I couldn't be called to that. But the truth actually is, in that moment, I was a skeptic of everything. I was skeptical that the last four years would mean anything. I was skeptical that God was going to use me in any meaningful way. I was skeptical that I had a purpose. So I challenged God. God, I said, if I'm supposed to serve you, you're going to have to do something wild, because otherwise I'm moving back home and putting on 40 to 50 pounds. Mom wants me back home anyway. This will be perfect. God was going to have to show up and give me direction for me to believe that this had all been worth it. That same night after the sit-down with a mentor, there was an end-of-school party that all the, grad, all the soon-to-be grads were going to. It was thrown by the school in our honor, and it was a night for us just to really celebrate all of our accomplishments. I couldn't go. I could not bring myself to leave my apartment. So I sat on my computer at my kitchen table, randomly looking at jobs. And then I came across a random job post on an obscure job site for a full-time youth ministry job I knew I didn't want in a town in Florida I had never heard of with the contact info of a pastor who had about the most southern accent I had ever heard, and I'm from rural North Carolina. The voice on the phone Scream yelled and told me to apply for it. For Thomas, it's not that he doubted Jesus. Thomas didn't doubt God. Thomas was skeptical that the very best thing in his imagination could happen because the very worst thing in reality had just occurred. When Jesus challenges him to put his hand in his side, it's such a clever rebuke of Thomas's skepticism. When Jesus shows up and answers his Thomas, Thomas's now obscene challenge with the exact same challenge, Thomas can, on, Thomas can only give one of the clearest proclamations in the Bible of the nature of Jesus. My Lord and my God, should be all of our reaction to witnessing the risen Christ. The skepticism of Thomas leads us to a powerful moment where Jesus gives the final and clearest beatitude. Do you believe because you have seen? Blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. So I don't believe that doubt was Thomas's true mistake. The other disciples who were gathered before had only believed after they saw as well. No, Thomas's mistake was a mistake I think we all as humans make 
in the wake of tragedy and heartbreak. Thomas withdrew from the community that loved him. He withdrew from the Christian community that had raised him up. And when he did that, he took away his chance at an authentic encounter with Christ. He sought loneliness as opposed to togetherness. And that is the truest rebuke in this story. Thomas may forever live with the moniker doubting, but it was not his doubting that made him different than the others. It was his withdrawal from his community. The good news, the gospel, is that Jesus can and will show up in all of our doubt. We just have to be available for that encounter. The truth is, this can be hard in the face of tragedy and in the face of our fear, but it is in those moments that drawing deeper into a loving community further points us to a God who calls us children and welcomes us into community with him. Let it be this week that you choose to stay in community with each other so that you can be led to an authentic encounter with a risen Christ. Let it be that after this Easter, is the time you choose to stay connected to him, to others. Let it be this time that you raise up as a community and support one another in Christian love. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your gift. We thank you for your community. Father, let it be that we stay connected to you completely, and connected to one another. Let it be your will that this community rises up to be a light in a very dark world. Let our doubt be used to further your kingdom. Let those questions be answered in a way so as to glorify you. Father, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.